And we are coming to the next chapter of this um, frequent item set part. We'll be looking at column-wise mining. And column-wise mining has been hype some 15 years ago, I think, when column store databases appeared. And people kind of took the same idea into databases. And usually, if you have a database, it would be stored row-wise. That is the formalism that we have defined the SQL databases on, for example. So that, that is the, the logic part, um, logic view that we are also mostly used to. We have this records type of notion. We have a customer. We don't have a column of first names and a column of last names. That is kind of unintuitive um, to well, most of the people, at least. So most of the time, we would be working logically in this type of records. And if you think of an online store, well, we print the bill. And the, the bill is exactly one row in this transaction um, type of database view. So it is related to our physical world, even. But it turns out that certain types of data processing is better done in columns. Not everything. That's why I'm not that big fan of um, column store databases. They tend to shine if you have lots of um, attributes that you're not using, and then you can avoid loading them. And they tend to uh, shine when you have data that can be compressed. Does this data compress? Most likely. It will, should compress quite well. And one way of compressing it is store it in columns. In columns, I can do some nice compression techniques. So instead of looking at the transactions, I'm now rewriting my data. And for each item, I'm appending the transaction number if it occurs. So the first transaction had A, B, and E. So I append A, B, and E to these columns. And the second one had B, C, D. So I put transaction number two in columns B, C, and D. But I'm storing it column-wise in my database. Now, the columns are varying length now. And I'm not storing the zeros. That's the nice part here. And I can go further and then apply compression techniques on this. For example, I can put intervals in here. That's the example I've been doing here. So for example, the column four, I've compressed this run of values into an interval four to nine. Transactions four to nine all contain A. And run length compression is one of the most fundamental and basic compression techniques. It works well if we have identical values in the column. If I have a column of names, there might be some very common names, such as Müller in German, and there might be 50 people in my list all named Müller, and then my column sort database can compress this and can say 50 times the name Müller. And if I do a select on the name Müller, that's good. And, well, this data in column store is essentially kind of binary data. Either the item is in transaction or it is not. And, but on a Boolean column, I can do run length compression quite well. There are some more techniques that are relevant, so you kind of all types of bit set compression techniques. That is what I can use here. So rowing bitmaps and all of that. Yeah. For some of these techniques, I can use them to compute intersections faster. So if I have this interval, 4 to 9, and the interval 4 to 5, I can compute the intersection 4 to 5 quite easily without enumerating and checking each of them. I can work on intervals easily. 
So the interval display, this interval version is suitable for this type of operation. And that led to an algorithm known as ECLAR. And it had quite some considerable improvements over a priori. But it had to change the logic of the algorithm a little bit. It's not a priori just with now column stores. But to make good use of this, we need to work column-wise and not row-wise. A priori worked repeatedly scanning the data in rows. So we can't just do a priori on this now. Instead of this breadth-first approach in a priori, level-wise, beginning with one item set, two item sets, and so on, we now would do a, a depth-first search for frequent item sets. But it's not the naive depth-first search that he might, that he should know from class. The data in um, ECLAR is essentially stored as an item set X and a TID list, which is a list of transactions that match this property. And in some extensions, there's also a delta, a change in TID lists. So based on that, I can do what I call a partitioned depth first search. And at this level, there comes some similarity to a priori then. We begin with the one item sets. The one item set is easy because we do have them here. And if a column is below the minimum length, we can skip it. So we already have the one item sets in this format. So that is cheap. Based on the, these one item sets, we now look at all combinations of them. We don't want to do them twice, so we're not combining I, A, and A, and A and B and B and A, but we're only combining them when Y is larger than X. That avoids the duplicate work. And then we compute the intersection of them. And if the intersection satisfies our minimum support, then we add it to our output at this level. If we have a non-empty set of output, then we do a recursion. There's an X missing at this point. I will have to fix this. So here, there should be an X, because that's this set in here. Why well, should always just use I? No, I is the input, OK. Yeah, so it's the new I that we're using, of course, for the recursion, not the old one. But, and that's where it gets interesting, a priori doesn't do this quite as blindly, and I might need to check that this, um, yeah. There's a subtle, subtle detail in this pseudocode. Notice that we are still in the for each loop. It is a tree-based recursion that we are doing here. It's not a sequential approach. And everything in here begins with X. All of these sets contain X. And we're only recursing on that part where X is like the smallest of them. And that yields this blockwise structure. We are intersecting the entire transactions. In the first step, that means just the columns that we had. But in the second step, this I will contain something like A, B, and the transactions that contained A and B. And then we might have A, C and the transactions that contained AC. And now we are combining these into ABC, and the transactions that contain ABC are obtained by intersecting these two lists. We're not going back to the transaction list we had from the previous round, where we had one item set, because they are larger. Intersecting with larger lists is more work. 
we are intersecting the smallest list that we can use or that we have easy access to. And that will lead to a different processing order. This is the processing order of a priori. I'm doing this sorted from left to right and level-wise. The one item sets, the two item sets, three item sets, four item sets. And that's why it's said a priori is breath first search. What I do in Eclat is I begin with the one item sets because they have like the empty prefix. And then I'm recursing into those item sets that have the prefix A. And then I'm going into the item sets that have the prefix AB. And then in those that have the prefix ABC. And then I'm backtracking and going into AC. Backtracking and then I'm going into prefix B and prefix BC. And finally in pre prefix C. So that is the, the way I, the algorithm does the recursion here. Of course, it's like not going back, it's simply just a return. And I could try to parallelize some parts of this easily. So let's look at an example of this. I have a list of 10 transactions. I have these A, B, C, D. And now I have to build this table, A, B, and so on. And then I can put my transaction numbers in here. So A, B, C, D, one contains all of them. And A, B, E, and A, B, D, E, and so on. And then I get my column-wise database. I'm writing it in rows. Logically, it's, it's not column-wise. And I have a list of these transactions. And at this point, I can eliminate C because my minimum support was 50%. And I ha don't have, this is no longer frequent. And now I'm interested in the combinations of this, Emp of this kind of empty prefix. So my initial class was this first level, A, B, D, E. All of them were frequent. And I now have to combine them. And I'm going to combine everything with A. So I compute the intersection A, B, the intersection A, B, D, and the intersection of A and E. And if you look at A and E, these match, these three match. This one does not. This one exists. This one is not. So um, we have, oh, there's actually an error in here. There's two missing. OK. Yeah, but it still would not be frequent. So um, it's, we have to have five. So. Now I can continue recursively. And I combine A, B, and A, D. I get a partition that begins with the prefix A, B, which only contains one combination now. It's frequent, but I can't further combine it. So my recursion terminates. Next part, we'll be looking at anything I can't build with B. So I'm con combining BD and BE. When computing the intersection, I know the length. So I know both of them are frequent. And now I can combine this to get BDE. BDE, it turns out, is no longer frequent. So next, I'm looking at the combination of DE. And that one also turns out to not be frequent. And then I have found all frequent item sets. And that's the same data set that we had before in the a priori example, if I'm not mistaken. And I get the, the same um, output. So the one that we, um, not the step by step, but the one that we had in this chart. So in, in this type of chart, these would be half the same numbers. 
And we saw there that a priori had two candidates where it um, counted them and then it, they weren't frequent. BDE cannot be frequent because DE was not frequent. So a priori would have skipped this one. Eclat does not because it goes deaf first and doesn't, didn't do DE yet. So it doesn't know that this one is not frequent. But even just checking that is probably more expensive than just doing this one intersection anyway. These type of intersections are cheap enough that it, usually Eclat is still much faster than a priori. <coughs> 